This is the pre-lab talk for experiment number two for Chem 120 lab, chromatography. The goals of this experiment are to help students describe the relationship between partition equilibrium and intermolecular forces. We will also use a new technique in pre preparing paper chromatograms to study the components of food colors and metal cations in solution. We also practice making good observations and drawing conclusions from those observations with the aid of relevant chemical concepts. For today's safety pause, we note that the concentrated ammonia and developing solutions used for the paper chromatograms are pretty corrosive and gloves should be worn when handling them. We also want to note that we're working with several flammable solvents, such as kerosene, hexanol, and ethanol. These chemicals should always be used in the hood and kept away from any open flames or sources of electrical sparks. We also have some special instructions for waste disposal. The waste for part one may be disposed of by flushing down a drain with plenty of water. The developing solution for part two, as well as the solvents used in part three and four, must be collected in separate waste bottles, which are stored in the hood. And as always, we want to make sure that we goggle it and wear a flame-resistant lab coat. The major chemical concept that is important for this lab is the idea of intermolecular forces. Those forces between separate molecules that are responsible for phase behavior and whether or not two components will mix. You re might remember from Gen Chem 1 that there are three major intermolecular forces. There are London or dispersion forces, which are forces that come from instantaneous and induced dipoles that appear in the molecules due to distortion of their electron clouds. These attractions are present in all molecules. You may have also learned about dipole-dipole forces, or the intermolecular forces that exist between polar molecules. Finally, there's a special intermolecular force called hydrogen bonding, which are present in molecules that have hydrogen bonded to oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. These intermolecular forces affect things like phase behavior, molecules that tend to have stronger intermolecular forces, like polar molecules or molecules that can hydrogen bond, tend to have higher boiling points than molecules that do not have these intermolecular forces, and whether or not molecules mix. The latter is the theory behind the like dissolves like rule of thumb that molecules with similar intermolecular forces will tend to be miscible or will mix together to form homogeneous solutions. Here's an example. The top molecule is a water molecule, which we know has three intermolecular forces present. London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, which exist because water is polar, and hydrogen bonding, as we see that hydrogen is bonded to, to oxygen atoms. If we want to predict whether or not water will mix with the two molecules below it, the one on the left is isobutane, and the one on the right is isopropanol, we need to look for similar intermolecular forces. If you look at isobutane, we see that they're only carbon-hydrogen bonds, which are not very polar. Therefore, isobutane only has London dispersion forces, which all molecules have. However, isopropanol is a polar molecule due to the polar carbon-oxygen bond in the molecule and the compact nature of the molecule itself, and can also hydrogen bond due to its OH bond on, on the right-hand side of the molecule. Therefore, we would predict that since isopropanol has similar intermolecular forces to water, the isopropanol and water mix with one another.
We know this to be true because you can buy solutions of isopropanol in water at the drugstore and also these isopropanol in water are present in hand sanitizers. However, isobutane is pred predicted to not mix with water since, it, since the intermolecular forces are very dissimilar. Intermolecular forces play a large role in chemical separations. A so an analytical technique used to separate and sometimes identify different components in a chemical sample. One technique of chemical separations is chromatography. In chromatography, there are two phases, the, the stationary phase and the mobile phase. The mobile phase is sometimes a liquid or gas that, that can move through the stationary phase, which of course, as the name suggests, state stays still. In the picture, there is an example of a paper chromatogram with two chemical samples, which move up the paper at different speeds. Also represented on the chromatogram is the solvent line, how far the solvents traveled. In chromatography, spots partition themselves between the mobile phase and stationary phase, which results in an equilibrium. We call the equilibrium constant for this type of equilibrium a KD, or partition coefficient. Molecules, molecules that, are, that have similar intermolecular forces to the stationary phase, in this case the paper, do not move as far up the paper with the solvent as, some, as other molecules that are more, have similar intermolecular forces to the solvent. So therefore, in the chromatogram that we see, we can conclude that the red spot has similar intermolecular forces to the paper and would more likely want to interact with the paper. While the green spot, which moves further up the paper, have might have more similar intermolecular forces to the solvent and therefore is a bit more mobile. This partition equilibrium is present in all forms of chromatography. For example, there's gas chromatography, which you might see when you take organic chemistry, where the mobile phase is a gas and the stationary phase is a, is a packing material in the gas column. Let's take a look at some points that are important to the procedure for our lab. In parts one and two, we'll be setting up paper chromatograms. Let's, we'll go through some of the important points of this in the video. But for now, let's, take a, let's preview some of this. For the, in a paper chromatogram, it's very important that you do not touch the, the the chromatography paper except around the edges. Since oils from your skin can interfere with the development of the chromatogram. Therefore, gloves will be worn and, and even then only the edges of the paper will be handled. When we're dealing with removing and adding the chromatogram to our developing chamber, we'll use the forceps in the drawer. As we set up our chromatogram and set up the lanes in which our spots will travel, we'll use pencil for marking. Again, the ink can interfere with the development of the spots since it may interact with the solvent. When we make our spots, we'll be using round toothpicks to make a spot that's about the size of a capital O. It is important that our spots do not get too large since they can interfere with one another and, and disturb our separation. Solvent level is also important. When we make our chromatograms, we'll put our our, our starting place for our spots about two centimeters from the bottom of the filter paper. We want to make sure that the solvent starts below this line. So it's important that we follow the instructions in the procedure, which call for us to use 50 milliliters of developing solution for part A, for part one, and 
40 milliliters of solvent in part two in an 800 and 400 milliliter beaker respectively. The reason why we want to make sure that the solvent starts below the spot, the starting line for the spots is to make sure that the spots don't just dissolve in the solvent, which will also ruin our chromatograms. As you can see from the picture, we have to staple our chromatogram into a cylinder to place it in the developing chamber. However, it's very important that when we do our stapling, we leave a gap between the two edges of the paper. This prevents the spots from traveling in other directions than a straight, than a straight line up the paper, which can again ruin the separation of their spots. For parts three and four, we'll be looking at the miscibility of different solvents with water and each other. All of the solvents that we'll use, including water, are clear liquids. Therefore, it may be difficult to distinguish the layers. The way that we'll distinguish them in this lab is to use different amounts of each liquid. In most of the runs, we'll be using four milliliters of water and two milliliters of the organic alcohol or, or solvent. Therefore, we'll know that the smaller layer is not water. When we're recording observations, one of the observations we can look at is the movement of the meniscus between the, between the two liquids. We would expect that two liquids that do not mix with one another will form multiple layers, two in many of the cases. However, if the meniscus of moves between them, we can tell that there might be some mixing. In this lab, we'll mark the meniscus of the initial water sample before adding the, the organic with a sharpie so that we can tell the we can tell if the meniscus moved during are mixing.